Okay. So, um, my name's Chris Gregg. This is Data Structures. I haven't seen you guys in forever, although I saw a lot of you guys at Lab yesterday um, and a few people at Lab on Monday. Um, so we're just a little bit behind, although the good news is I think we can catch mostly up today and next, uh, next Monday. Um, I actually have to go to Seattle this weekend and I'm hoping I get back on Monday. <laughs> By Monday, I hear there's supposed to be another storm like tomorrow night and then the weekend and thank you, climate change. Um, so a couple logistical issues at this point. Um, you should have gotten an email about homework one coming, getting back to you. Uh, if you didn't get a grade on homework one, it means that we weren't able to grade it for some reason. So please email me if you didn't like see a grade or you weren't able to get that grade because that means that I didn't do it. I also put the grades for homework one on trunk. So if you go to trunk, you should see the grades for homework one as well. They should match up. If they don't for some reason, let me know. Uh, and that will, uh, that will be that. For the lab, if you didn't get a chance to go to lab yesterday or Monday, which Monday certainly wasn't required because we had a snow day. Yesterday was technically required, but if you didn't go, that's OK. At least provide the lab. Like, try it on your own. If you can't do it, go to the, uh, go to the lab in office hours and actually like, find a TA and say, I don't know how to do this. It's not working, et cetera, et cetera. OK? We are going to grade labs based mostly on participation and going to labs. But if your lab just doesn't work, I'll take a point off for that, because you should try to get it to work. Now, what do I mean by like try to get it to work? Don't spend hours and hours and hours working on the lab after lab. Like, if you want to get it to work so you get that extra point, which is like one tenth of one percent of your entire grade, um, then then go right ahead. But uh, we're we're basically going to grade it like if it works correctly and it passes the test. There's your extra point. Okay, but what I, my, my big comment on that is prioritize doing the homework over doing the lab. Like in other words, if you haven't finished the homework assignment yet, do that before you go and do the lab. Okay, because at this point, and let, let me comment on homework too at this point. I talked to a number of people in lab yesterday who said, oh, I'm going to start homework too tonight, ha, 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 you know, and whatever, right? Guess what? This homework assignment, yes, it's not particularly hard, but it's hard to debug if you have like problems with pointers and linked lists in general can take some time to debug. I will have very little sympathy if Friday night I get emails from you saying, I can't find that last bug. Well, you just you had two weeks to find it, <laughs> right? And if you started the homework assignment today, I just don't have much sympathy for you, okay? So it's too late to start it today. Going forward, right? I mean, you're, if if you if you start it today and 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 uh, and then you know say, oh, I can't find the bugs. That's your problem, not mine. So I don't mean to be mean about it, but do the homework, start the homework early enough. Okay? So no emails saying, oh, I just can't find that last bug. Sorry, too late. Um, I'll, I will accept legitimate excuses, right? Like, oh, I've been sick this week, blah, 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 et cetera, you know, that sort of thing. But please don't bombard me with emails saying I need an extra day because, oh, I just didn't get it done. You've had a week and a half, and I should have seen those emails like three days ago. OK? That's enough of me being mean. Questions on homework to the labs, or anything else at this point? And maybe I just woke up grumpy today. Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions on, yes? Uh, I think I said Thursday, but I'll leave provide open for a couple extra days just in case. But, but um, again, prioritize doing the homework too over the lab. If you need a couple extra days in the lab, I won't close provide for a little while. Okay, next week's lab, same sort of deal. It'll, it'll be kind of due by the end of the week. Same sort of idea. Other questions? Okay. All right, so last time we met years ago, <laughs> Um, we started talking about linked lists. In the meantime, you've had all this time to do a lab and practice linked lists. So I'm going to fly through a little bit of this stuff with linked lists. But one of the things I just want to basically do a little bit more like content on from this other lesson was we will briefly talk about doubly linked lists because that's what you did in lab and we don't need to go over that again. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about circular lists. I will actually finish up talking about 
this asymptotic behavior. Remember we had this asymptotic behavior was how do we analyze programs so that we can compare algorithms or compare data structures and so forth. We're going to see that for the entire rest of the class. So we're going to have to talk about it a little bit more in detail today, practice a couple things, and then move on. And then after this uh, part of the lecture, we're going to switch to a different one, which is what I really wanted to cover on what day is it? We really wanted to cover this on Monday, but this other idea called stacks, which some of you may have seen before or heard of, but it's probably new stuff for most of you guys. OK? All right, first things first, um, I promised I would show you some obfuscated C. Remember, uh, remember I showed you some of the, um, uh, I showed you some programs that don't make your code look like this. Well, there is an entire obfuscated C contest where people uh, write programs that look like this. Now, literally, that is a program, right? It spells out fluid, but it's like you can see the little inc pound include stdio.h, et etc. et cetera. Like, that's a C program. Can you understand it? No, <laughs> because the only person that can really probably understand it is the person who created it who's a little crazy, <laughs> right? Because this is, this is kind of crazy stuff. But what's interesting is when you run the program, and that's part of the, the contest, is make a program that's really crazy and obfuscated, and then make it do something interesting. This guy won the program a couple years ago. And his program, I will run it for you. It happens to be on YouTube, right? And I'm going to, hopefully, I can get some sound, because it actually has some sound here. Uh, let's see if I do this. You do this, and then, oh, this is already down, so let's see. There we go. He's compiling it, obviously. OK, so, whoops. So he compiled it, right? He compiled this program, and then he's actually going to feed this program into the program. In other words, the program itself is going to get fed in to the program. That's where it gets crazy. The, the, the guy who did this said that his, like, his wife doesn't really talk to him anymore because he spent so much time <laughs> on this, for what it's worth. This is what his program is. It's literally a fluid simulator, a dynamic fluid simulator. And you think, oh, that's pretty neat. It does that, right? Well, what if you feed in this? He's just feeding it into the program. Oh, it's still simulating. You can feed in like random stuff into this program. You can download this too and run it. It's straight C code. Let's see, here's the pour out one. Watch this one. Whee. This is from that one little program that was this big that said fluid in it, right? Like, that's kind of crazy. You can see why the guy won it. And you can see why his wife's not talking to her anymore, because <laughs> it probably took him forever to, pull it, to figure this out. All right. There's a couple more that are interesting. In fact, he made a special program at the end of this. He said, well, here's a little extra for you if you want. And, I'll, and we'll get to that in a minute. This one's cool. Oh, it's an hourglass. So, so that's that one. Uh, let me show you one more here. He does one more. Color. He ended up doing it in color too. So, it's uh, you can see why he won this. Okay. So that's the that's the the fluid like obfuscated C program. If you if you have some craziness in your bones, then you could try stuff like that. Um, so some other ones. One of the other ones that I really like. Um, so, because so, I'm in the Navy, I like this one, right? Uh, you ever heard of like signal flags? Back in the day, in fact, they still do this, but if one ship wants to talk to another ship that's nearby, 
they actually have little flags that they hold up that mean different letters, like A and B and C. And that, those are the wrong letters. But those are, you can see these things, right? A is like this, and B is like this, and whatever. And two ships can see each other. And it means you don't have to have radio contact, which is kind of nice. You can actually see if you look through binoculars. And, and there are signal men who actually literally learn these things in basic training and whatever. So somebody wrote a little program that looks like a little flag. Right? That's the program up here in the corner. And this is what it does. I will run it for you. It's called Anderson. And what it does is if we type in something like tufts, <coughs> see the little guys there? They're like little men, right? That are little, like, little humans that are like holding up the right flags, right? And then the flag at the end means I'm done, right? So you can type anything. This is some more, oops, some more text. And it'll just do all the little flags, right? Just that one program. You know what category this one for? Best use of flags. <laughs> kind of funny. So anyway, so, so that's obfuscated C. As I said, try not to make your programs look like this, but it's kind of fun when you actually do find things like this. OK? All right. Let's see, best use of flags, yeah. OK, so let's go back to where we started. So drag out of your memory before all the snow, et cetera, et cetera, this algorithmic analysis. Now, this is pretty much where we stopped the other day. OK, we said there are functions which we like, which are on the left-hand side of this. In other words, they are what we call order one or constant functions. Now, let's remember what this means. If you have a program or a function or whatever, and it doesn't matter how many things you have in it, it always takes the same amount of time to do something. We call that constant behavior. In other words, you can have 10 elements in some, something or a million. And if it takes one second to do whatever you need to do with those 10 or those million, then it's constant time. That is the holy grail of computer science. If you can get constant algorithms, you're like very happy. Okay? The next one we have is logarithmic. Logarithmic algorithms are the ones where you're breaking a problem into like chunks that are half, 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 or a third, a third, a third. But in general, we'll talk about half. Remember the, remember the program that was, uh, or the binary search algorithm. The think of a number between 1 and 100 and then guess my number and tell me whether it's higher or lower. Each time you make a guess, you break the program in half, 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 half. That's logarithmic behavior. Okay, and we like that too because it's pretty fast. If you have 1,024 items in something and you've got logarithmic behavior, that means it's only like 10 times faster or, or to, do, to, to go through that 1,024 things only takes 10 steps because you can break it in half, 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 half until you're at the end. Okay, so that's good. Linear behavior is the one where we had, you have to go through every single element. So if you have 10 elements, it's going to take 10 time steps, let's say. If you have 100 elements, it's going to take 100 time steps. If you have 1,000 elements, it's going to take 1,000. Right? So if you have a billion elements, it's going to take a billion times longer than the one element one. Okay? So those we, we, don't, we don't love those, but they're not too bad. When it starts getting into quadratic and other polynomials, like the n squared and n cubed, we start to not like that. And if you remember, quadratic uh, <coughs> Quadratic asymptotic behavior is really why you have a really fast graphics processor in your computer. Because that problem comes out when you're doing with two-dimensional screens. You have an x and a y that's basically more or less the same amount. And that's quadratic behavior. You have to go through like a double, uh, a, a nested for loop to do that. Okay. For polynomial behavior, which is uh, like n cubed and n to the fourth and n to the fifth, they just get worse and worse because you have more and more nestings of your for loops. Okay? Did, we, did I say where you normally see cubic behavior? Did I say that? I forget. Three-dimensional, Three-dimensional things in real life, right? You've got an x coordinate, a y coordinate, and a z coordinate, or you know, whatever ordering you want. But that, there's even harder problems when you're talking about real three-dimensional space, right? Physicists have to deal with polynomial n cubed time all the time. And that's why they, they love graphics processors, too, because they can break problems down a little easier. And then exponential problems, like every time you add another element, it gets twice as, takes twice as long. Right? Those are problems that you don't like at all. Right? If we have exponential problems, 
they are very bad. I won't go over it because we just don't have time right now, but if you look up the Tower of Hanoi, it's a little game where you've got you've got three sets of like three posts and you've got a bunch of disks and you have to get the disks from one post to like the third post and you have to do it in a certain order when you can't have bigger bigger disks on top of smaller ones look it up that is an exponential uh, algorithm to solve that and it's it's not the kind of thing that you like if you can redo your program so it's not exponential you'll help things out okay we don't like exponential ones okay questions on that that was like the real brief review Okay, so we'll go through this pretty quick. If we do searching, don't worry about all the code here. There's kind of a lot of code. If you're searching through a list and you have to do it using a regular search, not a binary search, okay? If you're searching through a list of 10 elements, right? What's the worst case behavior? Like, let's say you're trying to find some element. How many would you have to go through in the worst case to find it? All of them, meaning that it is the worst, the worst case behavior is what we call O-N, meaning that you have to look through all of them to get there. What's the best case? If it was the first one. So in the best case, the algorithm is actually O-1, which is constant. Now, best case is O-1, worst case is O-N. We can sometimes talk about the average case, but we're not going to worry about that so much in this class. We generally worry most about the worst case because many times the worst case is the one that you care about, right? If it was constant, we'd love it, right? But many times you have to look through enough of the list to find something that, the, that you, you end up making it this linear behavior, okay? Sometimes we care about the uh, kind of the average case, but not for most of the things we'll talk about, okay? Binary searching, we all, I already said binary searching is the split in half, half, half. So with binary searches, we've got logarithmic behavior. Okay, again, if you, want to, if you want to go through this and see that this actually works as a program, you'll see, but basically it's the find my num guess my number program. Okay, guess my number, it's like you'd guess 50, I'd say it's higher, you'd guess 75, I'd say it's lower, you'd guess whatever 50 and 75, the middle between that is, et cetera. Okay, that's that, logarithmic behavior. When we start talking about these things, you have to consider, like the, remember we were talking about, um, we were talking about this is all based on like large numbers, okay? 1,000 elements is not particularly large, but take a look at some of the numbers in this case. If your, let's see, if your logarithmic version of your program, let's say you had a logarithmic version of some program, and it took 10 nanoseconds. Now, a nanosecond is a billionth of a second, okay? That is not enough time for you to even think, right? Logarithmic was 10 nanoseconds. If you had an equivalent algorithm that was constant time, it would only take one nanosecond. Okay? The difference, as far as we're concerned, between 10 nanoseconds and one nanosecond is nothing. It doesn't actually matter. You'll never be able to make anything matter about that. Linear behavior, on the other hand, takes a microsecond, which is a millionth of a second. Also not a big deal. right? If you had a linear, uh, a linear algorithm and the logarithmic took 10 nanoseconds. It's only going to take one microsecond, which is like a thousandth of a second, and you wouldn't care. Quadratic only takes a millisecond. Big deal, right? Millisecond's not a big deal either. Polynomial, let's say, um, I think I did it for n cubed, only takes a second. Now, a second is enough time for you to, to see it go, oh, it took a whole second. But still, who cares, right? If it only took a second to do this, you're not going to care one way or the other, right? The exponential, 10 to the 284 years, right? Which is longer than the universe has ever been around and will ever be around, right? So the exponential algorithm really kills you in this case. But who cares about the rest of them, right? What if we had the same 1,000 elements and the logarithmic one took 10 milliseconds? 10 milliseconds is, is now, still you can't really tell the difference between 10 milliseconds and a nanosecond as far as you're concerned. Your brain doesn't process that fast. Okay? The constant time is one nanosecond still, which is awesome, right? The linear now takes a second. But if you have a quadratic equation, all of a sudden you're up to 17 minutes, which you can definitely tell. Right? Like you're not gonna, you're not gonna, you're gonna sit there for the linear algorithm. You're gonna, okay, it's a second. Okay, it takes a second. If you all of a sudden turned it into a linear or a quadratic equation, some a quadratic problem, 17 minutes. 
the, the uh, cubic one, 700 hours, right? And then the exponential one is like just never going to end, right? The heat death of the universe. The other one would be the heat death of the universe too, but like really this one you would never even get anywhere near solving your problem. Unfortunately, there are other like real problems in computer science that are exponential, uh, and there's lots of ways you have to like go about trying to solve those without try without using the actual full algorithm. You'll get into those things when you talk when you get into algorithms class 160 and uh, computational theory 170. Okay, so you see how in some cases you 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 really want to be linear versus quadratic in this case. <laughs> Right? You don't want to wait 17 minutes for your program to open if you're Microsoft Word. Right? You'd, never, you'd never make it as a company. Okay? Questions on that? OK. Summary. Linear behavior, constant behavior we love. Linear behavior, at each step you reduce the problem by like one step because you've got that many elements. Logarithmic, uh, you cut the problem in half, thirds, whatever. Quadratic, doubly nested things, cubic, triply nested, and exponential. Exponential is you reduce a problem, but they're bigger subproblems, right? So you do reduce the overall problem, but the subproblem is actually bigger, which is not what you like. Okay? All right. So we, we ended with this when we first started talking about linked lists. Okay? To insert at the beginning of a linked list, What's the asymptotic behavior? Any idea what the asymptotic behavior is? What do you think? Why is it constant? Yeah, you don't have to actually move anything at all, do you? Right? You don't actually have to move anything at all when you're talking about inserting into the head of a linked list. Okay? For the head of a linked list, right, you have the head, right, and then more links and more links, and let's say no. If you want to insert there, you take your new node, you connect the pointer there and the head, you connect the next of the new one there, and the head goes to this one, and you're done. Did you touch any of the other billion elements there? Not at all. What if we wanted to insert into a, a dynamic array and it needed to be sorted? What's that behavior? We want to insert at the beginning of a dynamic array. Yeah? Logarithmic. Logarithmic. What do you have to do for an Remember what we have to do for an array? If we have an array here and we have 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and we're going to insert 5. We're going to insert 5 here. What do you have to do to every other single element? Move it over, Move it over if it needs to be sorted, right? You need to first do 10 there, then 9 there, then 8 there, then 7 there, then 6 there, and then you get to put 5 in there. And it works, right? That's not logarithmic. That's n behavior because you've gone through every single element. Okay, this is actually order n. So inserting at the head of a dynamic array takes time. Inserting at the head of a linked list takes zero time, all things considered. Right? So there's, a, there's one good thing about a linked list, incidentally, is it takes no time to insert at the head. Right? So we've got constant behavior. Okay? Good thing about a linked list. It would also be constant behavior if you were, well, let's say you were inserting at the tail and we did not have a tail pointer. What behavior is that? Why linear? Yeah, why linear? Uh, because you have to move through the entire list. To get to the end. Yeah, if you want to find the end of your linked list and you don't have a tail pointer, you start at the beginning and you go, are you or the tail? No, are you the tail? No, are you the tail? No, are you the tail? Yes, I'm the tail. Guess what? We went through all the elements. That's linear behavior. OK, so, so inserting into a linked list at the end, if you don't have a tail pointer, not a fun thing to do. OK? All right, questions on that? OK. All right, so insert at the tail. You walk the entire list, unless you hold a tail pointer. What's the asymptotic behavior of inserting at the end of a linked list? We just said that. We just ahead. It's order n. What's the insert of asymptotic behavior of inserting at the end of a linked list that has a tail pointer? Constant, right? Because you go right there, and you insert it right there. Okay, You don't need to walk through the whole list. 
Great. Okay. To search a linked list. So let's think about searching a linked list. For this homework assignment, you need to do a insert at index function. Right? That means that first you need to find that index. For a dynamic array, it was easy because you knew exactly where to go because you could do it randomly. Right? But for a linked list, you don't have index 2 here. Right? 0, 1, 2, 3. If I want to insert here, I don't have that one immediately. I have to start at the beginning and walk down to it. So what's the asymptotic behavior of searching a linked list? To ask your neighbor. Talk to your neighbor about this. Did you guys say it's order n? That's the worst case, right? Normally we care about the worst case. Why is it order n? Because you have to search through possibly every single one. What's the asymptotic behavior of searching a linked list best case? Constant, because it could be the first one. Can you do a binary search on a linked list? Let's say that the linked list, we knew it was in order. This was 0, this was 6, this was 10, this was 20, this was 22. Can we somehow do a binary search? The answer is no. You can't do it, right? You can't do a binary search on a linked list. Now, at the end of the semester, we will talk about another thing called a skip list, which is basically linked lists where we kind of improve it such that you can do binary searching on it. It's not strictly a linked list anymore, but we'll get there near the end of the semester. But yeah, if you want to do a binary search on a linked list, doesn't you can't. So even if you have a sorted by linked list, it's not doing you any good. Okay, think about the lab from this week, right? If you wanted to search for some, one of the runners, you have a nice ordered list, right? You have built an ordered list. Well, it doesn't help you in terms of searching for any of those particular runners. Not going to help. Okay. All right. So let's see. What's the key issue when deleting a node in a singly linked list? In a singly linked list. This is for the homework assignment. Think about it. If we want to delete this node, can we go to that node and simply delete it if we know that node? What do we need? Previous, right? Think of, if, you're, if you haven't done the homework yet for this week, think about the fact that you need the previous node in order to delete this one. Because if you're deleting this one, you need to get the previous next pointer needs to jump around it. So if all you had was this one, you have to walk through the whole list, find the previous one to this one, and insert it. Okay, this is where the bookkeeping part comes into play. It's a little tricky to like to do that. Okay, so that's the that's the big issue with linked lists there. Okay. Can we avoid this? We can. What'd you do in lab? Doubly linked lists, right? And I won't, again, I won't go into much detail because you already did this in lab, but the doubly linked lists allow you to traverse both ways and allow you at one node to see both the next and the previous. Okay, so that's the beauty of a doubly linked list. You found out from doing the lab that the hard part of the doubly linked list is keeping it all like under control. Right? Because there's all sorts of pointers. You always have to change four pointers whenever you do anything with a doubly linked list. And there's some special cases in there. Like the head is a special case where you have to change the head pointer to do that. Right? So more work from a programmer standpoint, but slightly better performance in the end. Okay? That's doubly linked lists. Okay, we already, this is all from the lab. Um, basically, you have to uh, change all four pointers. If you're going to insert into the linked list, doubly linked list, you did that in lab. Okay? And the special cases, if you, uh, in fact, this is not really a special case based on the lab because we happen to have a good insert after function. But you can, uh, you can take a look at this as well. Okay, I will breeze through this because of time. There are also these things called circular linked lists. Now, circular linked lists are interesting. What you do is the tail. Instead of pointing off into null, it just points back to the head. Right? And that's a circular linked list. And what's nice about that is if you're anywhere on the list, 
you can get to anywhere else on the list, even if it's singly linked. A singly linked circular list, you can still keep going forward. Now, there's a problem with this, right? If you tried to traverse this list by saying, while, he, while temp is not null, you're going to go on forever, right? Because you get to the end and go, whoa, it's not null, it's the head, ooh, you know, and you'd have to keep track of which one you started with. Okay, so we don't use circular linked lists too much, but they do exist, and you might see them at some point. In fact, I think some people have uh, asked if they can do a circular linked list for the homework assignment, and you're perfectly willing, uh, welcome to. Just don't break the interface. Okay, I wouldn't say it's necessary. In fact, it's probably going to be more work, but go right ahead if you want to. Okay, that's what a circular linked list is. Okay, keep track of where everything is, and don't tra traverse forever. All right, this is the singly linked circular linked list. Start anywhere, you can get to any other one. As long as you keep track of which one you started at, you'll go through all of them. Okay. That's it. Some pros and cons of linked lists. So the pros of these linked lists, right? You only need to insert one element at a time. You're not moving all these big like, structures around. No big movements for like we had with the dynamic array. Right? You also uh, have a constant insert at the head and remove from the head is also constant insert. That's nice, or constant time. <coughs> That's nice. However, can't do binary search. It's always order n behavior. It's not cache friendly. Don't stress too much about this, but in fact, I won't go into too many details, but your, your computer is made up of many levels of memory. When you go and buy more memory from your computer, you buy like, oh, I'm going to buy four gigabytes of memory, like RAM memory. Well, your processor actually has its own set of RAM memory. Normally, that's in, instead of gigabytes, it's normally in megabytes. And that's much faster, right? Why don't you end up buying the much faster memory for when you buy four gigabytes? Any ideas? More it's way more expensive. <laughs> yeah, it's not just expensive. Like, if you tried to buy four gigabytes of the really fast memory, it might cost you like $20,000, right? So they're not even going to like, have it available to you to buy because nobody would ever really buy it. Right? So, and not to mention that the memory system has to communicate with the chip, and there's other issues too. But arrays, which are nice and orderly in a piece of memory, are very good for this multi-level memory structure. Linked lists, you can have a linked list. If this was the memory system, like this, you could have a linked list node here, and the next one could be over here. And the next one could be here. And the next one could be over here in some other piece in memory. Not nice and contiguous in memory. That's bad for a system that has to rely on multiple memory things. Don't stress about the details. When you take a computer architecture course, uh, Comp 40, you'll talk about cache behavior. Uh, but just know that for linked lists, when you have this weirdly fragmented memory all over the place, it's much harder to uh, make things fast. Okay. And linked lists are also more complex. Pointers and, and heads and tails and nexts and previous, much more complex. Okay. All right, questions on that? OK, we did the lab, lab one, uh, homework two. Uh, remember, homework two is a singly linked list. Whoops, homework two is a singly linked list, OK? And again, if, you're having, if you are having trouble with homework two, you still got a couple days, but go into office hours. And uh, people, they will help you out debugging some of these things. Okay. All right. Any questions? Last-minute questions on linked lists or asymptotic behavior? I'll let you think about that while I'm opening up the next one. There we are. Okay. So. We've started with a couple data structures, right, that you've already reviewed. You've, that was mostly review. Yes, linked lists were a little bit different, but, it's, but from the people I've talked to who are doing the linked list assignment, it's a good review anyway because there's, there's lots to think about. We're going to start on another type of, uh, in this case, an abstract data type. We'll get into what that means in a little bit. Um, but we're going to start on some other, some other types of data structures and, and uh, and abstract data types that you haven't probably seen before. Okay? The one we're going to start talking about today is called a stack. Okay? And it actually is modeled by like a stack, 
like a stack of pancakes or a stack of Legos or something like that. Okay? You can actually, as it turns out, you can only deal with the top element in a stack. And we'll talk about why that's important in a little bit. Okay? And some of you may have heard of, quote, the stack in your computer before, or ever heard of a stack overflow, or the website stack overflow, right? All based on this idea. Okay? All right. Oh, I forgot. We're going to do a couple tips of the day here. Yeah, with stacks, we'll, we'll talk about a couple tips of the day. Um, I'll probably, given the time, skip the, the Eclipse one for now. But um, we'll do the, uh, the tips of the day here based on a couple of programs that, if you have a Mac, these are built in. They're also built into the, the uh, Linux server, the homework server. right? Here's what they are. Okay? There is a program called BC. Okay? BC. We're actually going to talk about two programs. One's called BC, one's called DC. BC actually came after DC, but I'll start with this one. BC stands for Bench Calculator. Now, back in the day, and I mean like in the 60s, okay, they had these calculators. And this was a big deal back then, right? Because you ever heard of a slide rule? You guys know what a slide rule is? It's like, a little, it's like the pre-calculator thing. Go look it up. It's kind of fun. I, I should bring one in. I actually have, I, I actually, my mom gave me my dad's slide rule when he was in college. And I was playing around with it. And what it is is it's got a, it's, it's literally a, let me show you if you haven't seen it before. Slide rule. Uh, let's see, images. So this is what a slide rule looks like. OK, hopefully that'll come up. Hello. Why aren't you coming up? There we go. OK, uh, view image. There we go. OK, what it is is it's these, like, it's got all these numbers on it, and there's an outer, like, an outer slide and an inner slide, which you can slide back and forth. And it allows you to do calculations. It allows you to do lots of stuff, like square roots and logarithms and all these hard problems, right? It was like the calculator back in the day. My mom gave me my dad's one from when he was in college, because she knows I'm a nerd. I mean, that's why. But, um, but anyway, she, she gave it to me. And I was like, whoa, this is cool. And I was looking at it, and I've used one before, but I couldn't figure out why this one, I wasn't able to use this one. Turns out the little inner slide can actually slide out, and it can be flipped over. The other side also has numbers on it, too. And you, it needs to be in the right orientation. And I realized it had been flipped over, and it was the wrong orientation. And then I thought, maybe that's why my dad failed out of engineering school. Because like, the whole time his slide rule was actually like backwards, right? I wonder. Anyway, um, so that's a slide rule. And this was before calculators, right? If you ever watched the movie Apollo 13, right? awesome movie about uh, Tom Hanks and whatever, and going to the moon and trying to get back, right? And that's it, right? Tom Hanks, right? You guys know all this. But anyway, great movie. There's a whole scene in there with the engineers using these slide rules. OK, before they, or after they had slide rules, they came up with these desk calculators, which were like this big. And they actually allowed you to do very simple but, but like hard to do calculations. So for instance, OK, if you're in BC here, you can do something like 2 plus why did it not show me that? There we go. 2 plus 5. Right? And it will tell you that it's 7. Right? Now, that's not particularly like, interesting, right? But when you do things like 2 times 5, five plus 4 minus 3 times 8, it, whoops, times 8, et cetera, right? It does it a lot quicker than you could probably have done that in your head. Although there are people who do these calculations like super fast, right? That was actually a really cool, neat thing back in the day, right? When you had these desk, cal desk calculators. BC is kind of neat in that it doesn't have any limited precision. So 2 to the 10th is 1,024, right? 2 to the 100th is a big number. 2 to the 1,000th is actually a much bigger number, right? And you can kind of see on here, this is like many characters long, right? Let's go one more. 2 to the 10,000th. OK, that's how big that number is. <laughs> right? It's like thousands and th I think I calculated that out. 2 to the 10,000th is actually, let's see. Oh, I don't have it on my little piece of paper here. Um, it's like, th like 3,000 characters long or something, or 3,000 digits long or something like that. Right? That's a lot of numbers. And by the way, do you want to try to calculate 2 to the 10,000th? No. BC does it for you really quickly, right? That's kind of neat. Okay, you can actually do BC 
with, in what's called math mode, which actually allows you to do decimals, which is kind of nice, right? 3 divided by 2 gives you 1.5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? What's kind of, if you do square root of 2, it immediately gives you the square root of 2. Kind of fun, that's pretty fast, right? You can set the scale to whatever you want. Scale equals 10,000 digits. Square root of 2. Takes a little while to calculate, like a second or two, right? But look, there's your square root of 2 to as many digits as you want, <laughs> right? You can calculate pi to as many digits as you want. Pi happens to be the arctan of 1 times 4. Actually, let me do this first. Scale equals 10. Arctan of 1, that's the way it does it, just A1, times 4 should give you, there you go, 3.14159265322, right? But if you do scale equals 1,000, right? Arctan of 1 times 4 gives you a nice big long, like, 1,000 digits after pi, right? When the first computers were like, built, they used to calculate pi on them and check them against another table of values to make sure that the computer was working right. Kind of neat. OK, a y so that's the BC calculator. You can go play around with it if you want, but it allows you to do mul- like, infinite precision sort of things. Now, I said there was another one called DC, and DC came before BC. DC was based on the actual first desk calculator. Okay? And it allows you to do things like this. Okay? 4, 5, plus. And then we have to print, actually. And it says 9. That's weird. 4, 3 times 2, plus. That's actually how you have to write this on the calculator. Like, literally, you had to write it this way. Right? 4, 3 times 2, plus. Any guesses what that means? Print means 14. Aha, somebody figured it out, right? But you can write like, lots of different things with this. So you could do, for instance, 12, 5, 3 minus times. 12, 5, 3 minus times. Any guesses on that one? Ah, lots of different guesses. So remember when you were in like, second grade and there was PEMDAS, right? Like the order of operations? This is In some sense, similar, but actually much, much better. 12, 5, 3 minus times is actually 24. OK? a y This is a completely different way of thinking about things, right? Remember, with it, if you're doing, by the way, how many parentheses did I put in there? None. I could have put parentheses in the BC calculator. DC does not need parentheses because of the way this is written. Turns out that you can use this thing called a stack to do exactly this. And there's lots of other ones like 12, let's see, 5, 6, 3 times plus minus. Good job figuring, like, good luck figuring that out if you don't know what's actually going on here. I will do it so you can see it's happening to be negative 11, right? But we'll figure out what's going on here after we talk a little bit about stacks, okay? This is a different type of calculator. And the first big desktop calculator, you had to do things in this case. And if you're really nerdy like me, you actually have one of these calculators on your desktop already, like your actual like, thing here. Like,、uh, what was it again? It was 12, 5, 6, 3、uh, times plus minus gives you negative 11, right? So I actually have one of those because sometimes it's actually easier to do it in this form. We'll get there. Okay? All right. So those are those two programs. You can use those on the Linux server if you want, the homework server if you want. Okay?、Uh, I was going to do an Eclipse tip of the day, but、I'll, I won't show you this. Lab one, for anybody who saw me in lab the other day, if you had like a seg fault or something else, I showed you how to use the Eclipse debugger. Super duper important to learn how to use a debugger, whether it's the Eclipse debugger or whether it's GDB itself. Because guess what? You will have seg faults in your programs this semester. Right? You absolutely will. And you will have problems where you have to go, I have no idea why this is not working the way I think it is. The best thing to do, put it in the debugger, which means you can step through line by line by line by line and see exactly what the state of your program is at any time. It's awesome. It's a really cool tool.、Okay? And it makes it so that it's easier, gets, gets you through all those crazy bugs a lot easier.、Okay? So, anyway, if you want help on how to use the debugger,、uh, Find me in office hours sometime and I'd be happy to show you how it works. 
The only time you really learn how to do it is when your own programs have bugs. Like we could do a lab, we may do a lab where you actually have to use a debugger, but if they're not your own bugs, you're like, ah, why am I doing this? If they're your own bugs, all of a sudden you realize <laughs> how worth it it is to use the debugger. Okay? All right, now. So I mentioned at the beginning, we mentioned what is this, this idea of a stack. A stack is an abstract data type, meaning that you have an interface to, a, to this thing called a stack. Under the covers, you can build a stack using any data structure that would actually work for this. For instance, you can use a, li you can use a dynamic array to build a stack. You can use an array, a, a linked list to build a stack. Okay? The abstract data type is the stack. It's basically the interface. There are three things you are allowed to do with these things called stacks. Okay? You are allowed to push onto a stack. You are allowed to pop off of a stack. And they made these terms like as if you were uh, using like a stack of something. right? They made it so that it was uh, kind of easy to understand in that sense. You can push onto a stack. You can pop off a stack. And you can do top, which tells you what the top of the stack is, but doesn't remove the value. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to model this like a stack of things, where this is the bottom, and it goes up and up and up. Okay? If we have some objects, let's say they're numbers on here, 6, 2, 5 on this stack. Okay? If you do a push, say push 3. If you do push 3, that takes 3 and it puts it onto the top of this thing called a stack. Okay. If you do pop, it actually takes the 3 off the top of the stack. If we do pop again, right? if we wrote pop again, it would take the next one from the top of the stack off. Okay. If we did top, what do you think that returns to us? Two, right? Guess what, folks? That's all you can do with a stack. Okay. Now, it seems like why would we ever want to use this? Well, lots and lots of problems, as it turns out, can be modeled with a stack. Okay. We'll talk about a few, and it happens to be so important, right? that we actually use it. On the next slide, I have a little thing that talks about where we use it a lot. But it's so important that it's like throughout computer science, we have these things called stacks, okay? because it's such a good abstract data type. When we do this whole t doing things on the just the top of the stack, this is actually called last in, first out behavior. Okay? If, we have, if we do a push, push, 3, that goes on here, goes on there. If we do a push 4, that one goes on here. Those are the, like the 4 is the last one into the stack. Guess what the first one to come off is? The 4, right? If you do a pop, it's the one that comes in. So this is called last in, first out behavior. You might have heard this in other, other uh, you know, places in your, in your uh, studies so far. But this is what a stack is. It's last in, first out behavior. Okay? The last thing that's in is the first thing that comes out when you do the removing from this thing. Okay? So even though stacks are limited in that you can only do stuff on the top part of it, right? if you want to get to the 6 here, you have to pop, 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 pop. But you can't get to the 6 except through the top of the stack. There's no way to do that if you are using a proper stack. Okay? You can't actually get down here. You have to start from the top. Even though that's a limitation, there are tons of things in computer science that allow us to do this. In fact, push and pop are really low level operations at the assembly language and like machine code level because so many things can get modeled with stacks. You can actually have a push and pop at the lowest level of your uh, computer system, okay? which is actually kind of neat when it comes down to it. Okay? Stacks are like super duper important in that sense. Okay? There's actually a stack built into every program that you run. Okay? This is why we have things like Stack Overflow and all that. Every, when you run a program, you get this place in memory that only allows you to, well, it's a little more subtle than that, but it m more or less only allows you to 
take from the top of the stack and do things at the, the top element on the stack. OK, your program gets that by default because it's very important to functions and function calls, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay? Here's one example of why stacks are important when you're running a program like this. Okay? Let's say we had this program here. You have a main function, and then you have two other functions. Your main function calls function 1. In other words, you're going down main, and then you get to function 1, and you call that function. Okay? We normally talk about it like this. We say, OK, we call function 1 and go over to function 2. Well, in memory, you actually have to, like, you, you can't just like go to some other place in memory and start operating on things. Can you say the following? In main, int main, uh, int a equals 2, and then uh, returns, uh, let's say we'll call function 2, function 2, right? Uh, and then return 0, right? And then curly bracket. You can say that. And in function 2, you could say, say, void function 2 int a equals 3. And then do some other things and then return to the main function. You can say that, right? Does that make, make sense? You can say that. When I get back over here, what is a equal? It still equals 2, right? Because this is a different scope, right? The whole idea that you can have variables of the same name in different functions means that we have to take care of all this stuff by saving what's going on in main when we call function 2. Okay? The way we save things is using a stack. Okay? The way we save the state of the program is using a stack. What do I mean by that? Function main calls function 1, function 1 calls function 2, function 2 calls function 3. When main calls function 1, the stuff in main has to get saved. When function two, 1 calls function 2, the stuff in function 1 has to get saved. When function 2 calls function 3, the same, same sort of thing, right? When function 2 calls function 3. Right? That's what we have to actually save the state of all this so that things like our variable names and everything don't get com like, uh, confused with each other. We actually use this thing called a stack for it, right? Main calls function 1, calls function 2, which calls function 3. And then function 3 returns. And you have to replace the state of the system so that you're back where you were. Remember, when function 2 returns, we need to have a be equal to 2 again, right? And how do we do that? We replace the state of the system that we saved earlier. Turns out, this is a last in, first out behavior. It's exactly what you use for a stack. Okay? Think of it this way. You have main running. When you call function 1, you save main, and then function 1 is running. But if you think of it like a stack, you function 1 calls function 2, and function 2 calls function 3. When function 3 is done, where do you go back to? Function 2. You go back to function 2 when function 3 is done. And guess what? Function 3 gets popped off the stack like that, and function 2 ends up returning everything back to where it was. When function 2 ends, you end up back in function 1, so you need to restore the state. Do you see how this is a last in, first out thing? Main calls function 1, calls function 2, calls function 3. And then the reverse happens when you return from function 3 to function 2, return from function 2 to function 1, return from function 1 to main. And it's exactly that first in, or last in, first out behavior. Yeah? Is that how recursion works? It's exactly how recursion works. Yep, this is exactly how recursion works. And in fact, recursion is just calling the same function, right? So if you called function 1 from function 1, which is recursion, you'd get another function 1 on top, another function 1 on top, another function 1 on top. Exactly. Okay. So this is stack-based behavior. This is why you actually have a stack built into all of your programs, every single one. Okay. Stacks are easy to implement. You've already got an implementation of a stack, basically. Right? If you have your dynamic array or your linked list, what you do is you just limit it. And you say you call, you call uh, push, insert into 
like insert into one, either the beginning or the end, depending on how you, which structure you're using. Right? You call pop pulling off of that same end. And you call top looking at that same end. That's it for a stack, okay? which is, makes it really easy to implement. If you know how to implement a dynamic array or a linked list, you can easily implement a stack. Okay? Where should we insert and remove in a dynamic array for the best performance? Kind of talked about this earlier. Think about this, think about this before you answer. Dynamic array. Where do we want to insert and let's say two, five, seven? Where do we want to, and I'll even put it here, right? Two, five, seven. Do we want to insert? Well, that's a bad idea. <laughs> there, like that. Do we want to insert here or do we want to insert here? Yeah, insert at the end because that was what kind of behavior? Constant behavior. If you insert at the end, you get constant behavior. Nine, right? Where would you insert? Uh, let's see, that might be on the next page. Um, that's constant behavior. Where should you insert for a linked list? Where, I'm hearing lots of answers. Where should you insert a linked list? Yeah. At the beginning, because we know we've got a head. And if it's a linked list, we already said that inserting in a linked list is also, at the head, is constant behavior. You insert this one, change the head to point here, change the next to that one, and you're done. So guess what is nice about stacks, right? You could also do it at the tail if you have a tail, right? So what's nice about stacks is we get this awesome constant behavior, OK? This is another reason stacks are great. Because as long as you limit yourself to problems that need stack behavior, and there are lots of them, you get constant behavior, which is awesome, OK? Stacks are great because everything you do is constant behavior, OK? That's what's great about it. There are some downsides. What kind of downsides can you think of to a stack? What kind of downsides are there? Six, two, four. What are the downsides to this stack? Yeah. Yeah. If you want to get something to the bottom, you have to take everything off first to get to the one at the bottom. That's a big downside, right? No random access at all. Like you can't even, and it's not even like a linked list where you could go, okay, I'll take the time to walk down it and get there. Nope, you got to get rid of the four, get rid of the two, then get to the six. So that's definitely a downside. Okay, no random access. Okay, you can't walk through the stack at all. Okay, either pop off the top or nothing, right? Or push more stuff on it. That's all you get. Okay, and there's no such thing as a search on a stack. Like you can't search through the stack and find if six is in the stack. You can say, what's the top? Oh, it's four. OK, thanks. Right? Or you can say, pop off everything until you get to six. But that would be the only way to do it. All right? So there's downsides to this. But those, for those problems, we use other tools. For the problems where we do have this behavior, where all we care about is the top one, and it can be this last in, first out behavior, stacks are awesome. Yes? You could totally do that. If you had a different stack and you wanted to say, here's my thing, I'd pour four into here, and then two into here, and then six into here, and I'd say, oh, there's the one I want, and then you put it back into the other one, you totally could do that. But you're really using two stacks now when that's really not a good data structure to use for this system. You would want to just use a dynamic array, right? Or something like that. But yeah, you could do that, sure. But it's just a different, you know, you wouldn't want to. Yeah? There is no such thing as insert into a stack. I mean, like, if you, so if you try and build, so if you have just like 10 elements, yep. and you want to put them all on the stack one by one, isn't that linear? Sure. Each one, though, is constant behavior. Yep. Uh, each, each element, is, in that sense, is constant behavior. And the, the, the operations we can do are all constant behavior. We can push, pop, and do top. Those are all constant behavior. Yes, if you had 10 elements, if you have n elements, putting them all in the stack is order n. Right? But, that's, but the operations you can do are all constant, you can, for each element anyway. Okay. Right? Whereas searching through a dynamic array, right, you're only searching for one thing, but you have to maybe look through every single one to get there. Right? So that's an operation you can do on a dynamic array. You can search on a dynamic array, but that could take 
and behavior. OK? Good. All right. Here's another example of how we can use a stack to solve a problem. Okay? You guys know when you use an editor, if you use a good editor, it will tell you when your brackets and braces don't line up. Right? It'll tell you that. Like Eclipse is good. It'll actually format it all. Like if you if you click control A, control I, it will reformat your whole file and put the and make everything tabbed out correctly. It's actually kind of neat. Right? If we want to say whether or not this program has the right number of beginning braces and end braces. We can do that with a stack, as it turns out. Okay? So here's a program. I think it happens to be correct, right, in terms of the, in terms of the curly braces, right? But whoops, we should probably think about how to do this. Right? Let's say we have a stack here. Okay? And let's say we want to walk through a program and figure out if all the left parentheses and right parentheses match up and if all the right brackets and left brackets or left brackets and right brackets match up and if all the curly braces match up as well okay anybody want to th- talk to your neighbor for 2 minutes and think about how you might use a stack to do this okay if you don't understand the question well ask your neighbor and say do you understand the question Okay, who thinks they have an idea? Thinks they have an idea. Somebody who hasn't answered yet today has an idea. From the middle here. Yes. So every time you encounter one type of brace. Okay. When you say one when you say every time you encounter one type of brace, what if I encounter a that brace? Almost though. I think you're you're getting you're getting there. Yeah, what do you think? Oh, okay. What do you think? No worries. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. What do you think? I, I like we had a, I like your idea, but there's just a minor detail. Yeah. So with the first curly brace, in order to so you would put that you would commit the top of that. And then if the next brace Hold on. So let's say you if you encounter every time you encounter a left type of brace, push it on the stack. OK, I like that. So that's really, that's pretty. So for this one, right, well, the first thing we get to, do, do you do anything with the regular characters, like the non braces? Just ignore them, right? Take some input, ignore those non ones. The first one we get to is a left parenthesis, and we push it on the stack. OK, then what? Then you just keep pushing uh, as you encounter braces. And then if you encounter a, a right brace, ah. OK, if you encounter a right brace, then you, things are different, right? So in this case, so we're going down here. We get to the first left uh, parentheses. We go down. Then we hit all of a sudden a right parentheses. What do you think you do? OK, you, you pop what? Let's, let's, yeah, you pop this one off. So we, we have a right brace. And you pop off the left brace. And what do you do? You compare them. Is this a parentheses? Yes. Is this a parentheses? Yes. We're good to go. OK. So that happens to be more or less the entire algorithm, except for one key thing. So we're going down. Let's keep going on this and seeing if it works. After the right parentheses over there, we get to a left curly brace, and we push that on. And then we go down, and we get to a right curly brace. So we pull it off, and we compare, and they're OK. Trust me, it gets a little bit, it gets a little bit easier here, or a little bit more interesting here in a minute. We get to the left 
in front of the int, and then we go along and we push that on, and then we go down and we get to the right for the int, and we pop off, and we check, and they're both parentheses. Then we get to a left curly brace all the way on the end there, and we push that on because left we push on. What's the next thing we get to that we care about? The square bracket, which is a left. We push it on. Okay? And then we get to what? A right square bracket. So we pop one off, and notice the one that comes off first is the square bracket. We check, and we've got two square brackets. We're good to go. Then we go along, and we get to another left square bracket, push it on. Then we get to another le- right square bracket, push, pop this off, check, yes, two square brackets. And then we go along, and then finally we get to a left curly brace. Pop that off, left curly brace. Now, that's the main algorithm. What's one thing we have to definitely check when we get done with the whole thing? Is there anything left over? Right? What if we forgot that last curly brace? We could get to the end of the program, and we haven't had any mismatches, but there would still be a curly brace on there. So you have to say that the stack is then empty. Okay? And normally we have a, a function called isEmpty for a stack, which just returns true if it happens to have no elements in it. Okay? So you guys are pretty good there. Read all the char- make an empty stack. Read all the characters until the end of the file. If the character is an opening symbol, opening brace or bracket, push it. If it's a closing symbol, we didn't talk about that. If, the, if it's a closing symbol and the stack is empty, guess what? Broken, right? So you'd have to check that too, right? Because you could all of a sudden, if you said, if you said something like this, if that or something, right? Like that's a bad program automatically. Because nothing's on the stack and you have a closing one. You never had an opening one. Okay? Uh, if the symbol popped off is not the, otherwise pop the stack. If the symbol popped off is not the corresponding open symbol, then you've got an error. At the end of the file, if the stack's not empty, report an error. And that's the whole thing, right? Which we just went through for this. Okay? Pretty simple stuff when it comes down to it. Okay? And that's a very good situation where you can use a stack. Really easy. If n is the number of characters in the file we are reading, what's the asymptotic complexity of the whole algorithm? What do you think? This is actually this is like the next level deeper for this uh, for this asymptotic complexity. Let's go back to the let's go back to the thing here. In this file, if there were n characters in this file, how many times did we touch each character when we were reading them in? Once, right? If we read n characters and touch each character, what kind of behavior is that? Linear behavior. Is that what you're going to say? Order n behavior? What's that? You do have to compare them, right? Every so often you have to compare one. Guess what? That's a constant value. Like that's not a not anything that adds to the number of times you have to look up the, the thing. If it was all braces, you would have to do twice as many comparisons. But two n is still order n behavior. Okay? So that's a key key part there. All right. In the Unix tip of the day, we saw that uh, DC calculator. We call that behavior that remember we had the uh, four, five times behavior. This is actually called reverse Polish notation. Right? Also called postfix notation. The reason it's called reverse Polish notation is because the guy who invented the opposite of this happened to be Polish. Right? And so they called that Polish notation. Right? And so the one we're doing is the reverse of that. So this is actually called reverse Polish notation, as it turns out. Okay? We'll also call it postfix notation. What it means is that the operator, in other words, the plus or the minus or the times, follows the operands. And that's all that you have to think about for this. Okay? In this case, 4, 5, 6 plus star. 4 comes first, then 5. 
but there's no operator after that. So we can't do anything yet. The 6 comes next, but then there's a plus. You think about that plus acting on the previous two things. Right? So the plus in 4, 5, 6 plus, the plus gets, acts on the 5 and the 6. Okay? And what's left over when you do 5 and 6, or plus 6, you get 11, right? That is, is now the second operand to the times. So really, this goes like this. This 4, 5, 6 plus times. You go 4, 5, 6 plus, which operates on this and this. That leaves us with 4, 11 times. And the 11 acts on the, or the times acts on the 11 and 4, giving us 44. Now, guess what we can use to actually implement this? A stack. Okay, as it turns out, let's just walk through it before we even figure it out. We said 4, 5, 6 plus times. Any ideas how we might do this on the stack? Yeah. What do you think? Go ahead. OK, I like that. If you encounter a number, push it on the stack. 4, 5, 6. Next step. Oh, go ahead. Operator. OK, so if you find an operator, what do you have to do to the stack? Pop twice, right? So we find the plus, and we pop twice. And we say 6 and 5. We pop off the stack. And then we add them together using that operator. What do we do with the result? Push it back on the stack and keep on going. So the only thing that's left, we did the 4, 5, 6 plus. Then we get to a times. And that says pull off the last two, like, or sorry, pop off the last two and apply that operator. We pop off the 11. We pop off the 4. We apply the, ele- the 4 and the 11. And what do we do with the result? Push it back on the stack, right? And we keep going. When we get to the end, where, where's our, our, our final answer? You just pop another one off the top, and that's your answer. So this actually works for any string of characters like this for this reverse Polish notation. It's actually pretty cool, right? When the operators found it acts on the previous two values that you've, always, you've pushed back on there. Okay, so let's just quickly go through the one that I put on the calculator last. Okay, 12, 5, 6, 3 times plus minus. Okay, this is actually a pretty quick one as it turns out, right? Push 12, push 5, push 6, push 3. You get to the times, pop off the 3, pop off the 6. Multiply them together, push the result, 18. Then you get to a plus, pop off the top two there. 18 plus 5 gives you 23 with an addition, right? 23, oops, 23. Push that back on, right? And then you do the minus, which you say pop off the other two, 23 minus 12, right? Oops, sorry, I lied. You actually do it the, you actually have to, as it turns out, you actually do it, you apply them to the, this one gets first, goes first, right? 12, and then you pop off the 23 and the 12, and it ends up being 12 minus 23, right? And you do that, and you end up with negative 11, which you pop back on here, and then you get to the end, and you're done. Okay? So it's a nice stack based system for doing this. The original. Here's some other ones you can do. By the way, two things about this. No parentheses are needed. All that PEMDAS business, not necessary. That's kind of nice, right? This is one of the reasons I have a RPN calculator built in, because I never have to do parentheses, right? And that's the first thing. This was the original, one of the original desk calculators. Right? It's about this big. It's actually bigger than it looks. It's about this big. Uh, that was in 9, let's see, that was, uh, 
It doesn't say when it was. Sorry, did I? Did I oh, in 1968. This is 1968. You could buy this for about $5,000. It would sit on your desk. And you could do calculations like this. And that all, it actually had the ability to do functions and stuff too, which was kind of neat. $34,000 would buy you that today. Well, in today's money, right? If you had one of these on your desk, you probably worked at a pretty big company, as it turns out. But that's that, OK? But it was cool, because you could do all this stuff with it, right? And you could do that. We can also convert our regular parenthesis-based parenthesis based arithmetic to this postfix. It takes a whole bunch of other steps, but you still only need one stack, as it turns out. I'll let you read those on the, on the website if you want. Okay. All right. Prefix, that's another type of notation. And we aren't going to use that too much. We will see these again when we talk about binary trees. We will see all of this stuff again when we talk about binary trees. OK? All right, questions? All right, we're almost back on track. I'll see you guys Monday.